You see this air compressor that the mechanic's using to fill up that motorbike tire? Well, that's the exact same air that this guy is breathing from a hose that goes all the way up to his boat on the surface. He's 80 feet deep with no dive buddy, no dive computer, and no safety equipment. It's the middle of the night. He'll stay down here for at least five hours, dragging his boat along behind him for the entire dive. He does this every single night. Oh, and the reason that he's only 80 feet deep is because we want to be extra conservative while we're filming around him on scuba. If we weren't here, he'd be going as deep as 100. 150 feet. This is the most dangerous method of fishing on Earth. He's he's diving. On compressor and he dies. And he dies. According to National Geographic, there's a tribe of nomadic spear fishermen that can hold their breath for over 13 minutes and free dive 200 feet deep while searching for fish. Apparently, these sea nomads have evolved differently from the rest of humanity, giving them superhuman freediving abilities. Some reports have claimed that they can even see clearly underwater without wearing goggles. To put this in context, the current freediving world record is 429 feet, held by this guy, Alexei Malchinov. You heard that right. He can swim down 429 feet and back on a single breath of air. Having said that, his breath hold was only four and a half minutes for that dive. Not even close to the 13 minutes that the sea nomads can do. Oh, and he barely ever blacks out. Anyways, the current world record breath hold is 11 minutes and 35 seconds, held by this guy, Stefan Mifsud. <laughs> Not quite as long as the sea nomads, but pretty close. So technically, it could maybe be possible for these sea nomads to dive 200 feet deep for 13 minutes at a time, but those two guys are professionals. They've devoted their entire lives to training. And Alexei Molchanov can only go that deep if he's wearing this big fancy monofin. And Stefan Mifsud can only hold his breath for that long if he literally floats around in a pool while doing nothing. If he were actually moving his body while diving, he wouldn't even come close to 13 minutes. And not only do these sea nomads have little homemade flippers strapped to their feet, rather than a big powerful monofin, if anything at all, but they are spearfishing, which means that after they first paddled their boat out to the fishing spot, they proceed to swim around for hours on end, burning up huge amounts of energy. Neither Alexei Molchanov nor Stefan Mifsud can go that deep for that long in that situation, even with their fancy freediving gear. In fact, even dolphins generally only hold their breath for five to 10 minutes, not usually diving more than 150 feet deep. So basically, my point is, that's a pretty bold claim that National Geographic made. Not only is this entire tribe of sea nomads better freedivers than the current world champions, but they're apparently better divers than dolphins as well. And as it turns out, most of these sea nomads live in Indonesia, and I live in Indonesia. And flights here are unbelievably cheap. And I have to see for myself if these guys really are that amazing at freediving and spearfishing. Should I say something to the camera? Yeah. Going to Sumbawa. I fucking hate talking to the camera, but I'm gonna try and do it this trip. It sounds awkward. Just bear with me. What? Do I look sweaty? This is Bali. The next island to the east is Lombok, and the island after that is Sumbawa. That's where we're going. According to Google, there's a group of these sea nomads, known locally as the Bajau people, living on an extremely tiny island in the north called Bungin Island. Oh, and by the way, this hat that I'm wearing is available at AquaticApes.com. It's inspired by the classic polo cap, but with fish embroidered on it. We've got a bunch of different fish species and hat colors available to choose from on my website. Anyways, the first thing you notice about this place is the goats. There are thousands of them, and they all seem to be eating garbage. The second thing you notice is how incredibly friendly all of the people are, which is good because I'm hoping that someone will take me out spearfishing. But first, we need permission to even be here. So basically what we're doing right now is going to ask the head of the village for permission to film here and sort of make a YouTube video. I hate talking to the camera. All right, let's go. It's obvious that life on this island is centered around the ocean. It's sort of like the Venice of Indonesia. Apparently, Bajau children learn how to swim before they even learn how to walk. Whether you're an old man or a little kid, everyone here is either fishing or preparing to go fishing. <laughs> and around every corner, fish are being grilled. Our presence is quite the spectacle. Everywhere we go, a bunch of excited kids follow us around. Maybe because they're hoping we'll fly the drone again. The houses here are all on stilts, built on a foundation of chunks of dead coral. People here in Pulau Bungin, they brought the corals from the sea and make 
they for their foundation of house. Mm. Turns out, it's not just the houses that are built on piles of coral. So this is all coral that we're walking on. The coral is meant to make the this entire island, which is home to over 3,000 sea nomads, is literally just a man-made pile of coral and cement. The first island, a small, like 40 meters square. That's it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe here is the most crowded Iceland in the world. In fact, the name of the island, Bungin, literally translates to Mound of White Sand. What was once just a 40 square meter patch of sand 200 years ago, today is the most densely populated island in all of Indonesia. I couldn't verify if it's the most populated island in the world because I'd imagine that Manhattan would give it a run for its money, but the point is, a lot of people live here. And it's still expanding. When a member of the Bajau tribe gets married and wants to build a house for his family, he doesn't buy land partly because there is no available land. The island's already full. But also, why would he buy land when he could just go out into the ocean for free, collect a bunch of coral, pile it up in the shallows near the island, and then build a house on top of it? There are tons of these piles all around the island, and they've been doing this for hundreds of years. Maybe they'll build a bamboo bridge from their new house to the main island, or maybe not. Maybe they'll string an electrical wire out to their house, or maybe not. There was a serious earthquake around here just about a week ago. It was so powerful that it leveled many of the modern cement houses on the mainland. But here on Bungan Island, not one single house fell. I think that the reason for that is because the stilts allow the houses to sway, just like modern earthquake-proof buildings. Oh, and the reason that the goats somehow survive off eating paper and garbage is because grass, which goats normally eat, doesn't grow on dead coral and cement. So apparently these goats have such big pot bellies because of the garbage they eat. Fun fact. As we walk around the village, there's fish everywhere. Banyak ikan. Yeah, banyak ikan. YouTube channel, YouTube. Yeah. I cannot wait to get out into the water and see these legendary spear fishermen in action. These are all moray eels. Wow. And box fish. <laughs> so many box fish. Boss. 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 Hello, Pa. Hello, Pa. <laughs> boss muda. Boss muda. Oh, uh, the young boss. The young boss. <laughs> <laughs> Although the locals are a little confused when I ask if they can take me out spearing in the morning rather than at night, considering that almost 100% of the residents here are spear fishermen, it's pretty easy to find someone to agree to take us out with them the next day. Mary. Yeah, Mary. Namasaya Mary. You Merry Christmas, a married <laughs> Okay, I actually just lied to this guy. In fact, I've been lying to all of the villagers about this. That's my girlfriend, not my wife. But the locals here are Muslim, and I don't know if they'll have a problem with us sharing a bed together out of wedlock during our visit. Turns out, though, I don't need to worry about that because there is no bed for us to sleep on. So the, some of the guys here were kind enough to literally let us sleep in their house and they're gonna like double up. There's not like there's hotels around here. And so this is where we're sleeping on the floor here. And um, if you wanna go to the toilet, that's the toilet there. And I'll show you the toilet in a second. A lot of what you see online about Indonesia is luxury resorts, floating breakfasts, slow motion backflips, beach clubs, and women in thong bikinis leading you by the hand through various beautiful landscapes and rice fields. But that's not the real Indonesia. This is the real Indonesia. And in the real Indonesia, the culture is richer, the people are friendlier, the fish are bigger, and the food is tastier. It's also spicier. Speaking of which, if you do decide to visit the real Indonesia, I recommend bringing your own toilet paper because otherwise you'll be stuck using a ladle, like this. The next morning, it's finally time to go diving. I'm giddy with excitement. In the free diving community, the Bajau people are legendary. There's been a ton of documentaries made about them by the BBC, National Geographic, and even a cinematic documentary called Jago, which you can find here on YouTube. In these documentaries, they not only show how amazing these guys are at diving, but they show how idyllic their lives are. Living off the sea, disconnected from the modern world, diving deep, catching fish, and then grilling them on their little rowboats immediately afterwards. I've been a huge fan of these documentaries for years, and here I am, ready to tell my own 
similar idealistic story. Okay, I hope this audio is good. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but as you can imagine, this is not a traditional Bagile boat that these guys would normally use. Um, there's a lot of us, and I'll show you what the boat looks like in this clip. You can see it's uh, very different than what we're on now, which is kind of like some sort of a government boat that they have here. But there's so many of us, we have to take this out to get to the spot because the other boat they would normally use is way too small. So it's not totally authentic. These guys have told me that National Geographic and BBC do the exact same thing, but they just don't tell you about it. Pretty much all of his gear is homemade. Scuba fins glued to his shoes, a weight belt made from fishing weights glued to a big piece of plastic, and of course, homemade spear guns. He didn't make his mask Can you though. ask him which one he likes more? Any? Any? This one, yeah. This one, uh, traditional. They don't use this one. Apparently, he thought that I wanted him to pretend that he still uses these traditional wooden goggles for my video. His ancestors used to use them, as did he back in the day, but not anymore. And who can blame him? He also thought that I wanted him to pretend that he goes out fishing in a little rowboat, like this, rather than his actual boat, which is powered by an engine, like this. And as much as I'd like to share a perfectly idyllic hunter-gatherer lifestyle in this video, I'm not interested in pretending. Okay, let's quickly talk about how these guys have evolved differently from the rest of humanity, turning them into superhuman freedivers. Here's a clip of Australian freediving champion Adam Stern as an example. On this dive, he's on his way down to 300 feet. During his descent, his heart rate automatically slows down to conserve the oxygen that's stored in his blood. And the ever-increasing water pressure is shrinking his lungs as he goes deeper and deeper. At 30 feet, they're half their normal size on the surface. And soon after that, he no longer needs to propel himself down because his lungs are now so small that he no longer floats. And now he can just sit back, relax, and let gravity do all the work for him. At 100 feet, his lungs are 25% their normal size, and they'll continue to shrink until he eventually turns around to swim back up. His spleen is also changing under the pressure. The spleen is an organ that stores extra red blood cells, which carry oxygen throughout our bodies. And on a deep dive like this, every little bit of oxygen is vital. The pressure of the water is squeezing his spleen, causing it to release some of its stored red blood cells into his bloodstream, giving his body some much needed extra oxygen during the dive. This is exactly what Lance Armstrong got in trouble for doing, enriching his blood with extra oxygen via red blood cells, turning him into a super athlete. Only he did it medically, and right now, Adam's doing it 100% naturally. The spleen is essentially a secret reserve of extra oxygen in the body, and it's activated automatically when you dive deep. All humans naturally have these abilities, and there's a name for it, the mammalian dive reflex. But humans aren't the only ones with the mammalian dive reflex. Whales, dolphins, seals, walruses, and the bodies of every single mammal that spends any time underwater do the exact same thing. Of course, their mammalian diving abilities are much better than ours. Some whales, for instance, have evolved to have up to 14 spleens. Can you imagine how much deeper Adam would be able to go if he had 13 extra oxygen storing spleens in his body? Even just one spleen that's a little bit bigger would probably make a huge difference. And that right there is how the Bajau people are different from the rest of us. All Bajau people have spleens that are, on average, 50% larger than the rest of humanity, which means, theoretically, they can store and release 50% more oxygen-filled red blood cells during a dive than us mere mortals. And so, having said all that, let's throw on the timer and see that giant spleen in action. I'm confused. Why can't he go deeper than like 20 feet? And why is he struggling to hold his breath longer than like 30 seconds? He should be able to stay down there for at least another 12 minutes. I can tell that he's got some good spearfishing technique. He clearly understands how to find the fish and how to get close enough for a shot. 
and his aim is amazing. I mean, it's got to be when your target is so small. I'm sure he'd rather be spearing bigger fish, but there are none left, at least not at these depths. After three or four hours of diving, this is his catch. Anticlimactic would be an understatement. On the way back to the island, I realized that he didn't just offer to wear those little wooden goggles and pretend to use a little wooden rowboat for my video. He was also pretending that he actually goes freediving to catch fish because he thinks that's the story I want to tell. He's seen those BBC documentaries as well. Some of these guys have probably even been in them. Anyways, it's because of those documentaries that I was expecting to see a rich freediving culture around here. But instead, I kept hearing the same word over and over again. Compressor diving. It's what that guy was doing in the beginning of this video. They have a children, so many people here. So the beast is run away yeah. <laughs> behind the island. So update for compressor. It's what everyone here does now to catch fish, including this guy. It's not that he's unable to freedive well. He just doesn't practice anymore. Even orcas in captivity are reportedly unable to hold their breath for more than a minute or two, which is not only less than the 10 to 15 minute breath hold of a wild orca that practices every day, but it's even less time than I'm able to hold my breath for. My point is, if you don't use it, you lose it. And why would he use it? Even a giant spleen like the one he's got is nothing compared to a tank of air. Speaking of which, he invites us to go out with him the next evening and see how he really does it. But there's no way I'm breathing from an air compressor built for inflating car tires at the bottom of the ocean. And there's no scuba shops around here either. So I called some friends back in Bali who rented some scuba tanks and scuba equipment, drove two hours to the ferry port, took an eight hour ferry ride with their car to the island of Lombok, drove four hours across Lombok, took another ferry to Sumbawa and arrived here at Bungan Island around two in the morning. But. Before we get into the compressor dive, if you're interested in learning how to activate your own mammalian dive reflex, I highly recommend taking a freediving course. Most people with normal sized spleens can learn to dive to around 75 feet after just a day or two of training. And there are freediving schools all over the world, including here in Bali. In fact, there's a big freediving festival here in Bali from April 22nd to 29th called Deep Week. It's run by Adam Stern. Remember this guy? I'll be hanging around there. And if you're interested in joining, head over to Adam's website, freedivingfamily.com to check out the details. Anyways, this isn't an island of freedivers. That was just an idyllic fantasy in my own mind. This is an island of fish assassins. Some of the most experienced watermen on earth. True experts who catch a lot of fish with very little means. And freediving is just one of many arrows in their quiver. There is one guy who actually still freedives to catch fish, but only when he's chasing one specific fish. Spanish mackerel, one of the most valuable fish at the market. Because it's actually easier to catch these fish while freediving than on compressor. But when they aren't in season, he dives on compressor like everyone else on the island. And why wouldn't he? He'd earn way less money otherwise, and his job is to feed his family. From a meter uh, range. Two meter of this. Two meter. Yeah. This, they use, the, like, see this hole? It's not drill. Mm. So they put on fire, and they put another steel, and they make they hammer, it. hammer it. Normal, normal. 15 meters of that. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the day, freediving was much more prominent in their daily lives. It's a story that everyone here seems to repeat. The old men used to be amazing divers, and the young men all have fathers and grandfathers who were also amazing divers back in the day. Some of the older guys do have pretty crazy stories though. This guy, Pat Dean, told me one story that involves a mantis shrimp and a dugong. In case you don't already know, a mantis shrimp is about four inches long, and its punch is faster than the speed of a bullet. It's one of the fastest movements of any animal on Earth. And a dugong is a marine mammal that weighs up to 1,100 pounds. With a diet consisting mainly of seagrass, it's actually the only herbivorous mammal that lives in the water 100% of the time. Anyways, many years ago, while he was out spearfishing, he once saw a dugong munching on seagrass just a little too close to a mantis shrimp, at which point the mantis shrimp jumped out of its hole and punched the dugong in the head, killing it instantly. He also once watched his dive buddy get eaten alive by a saltwater crocodile while they were diving for lobster. Living as a nomadic spear fisherman is not an easy life. As we prepare for our dive this evening, one of the guys tells me about a compressor diving accident that happened just a few days ago. Look like this. So the air not come to... So he was diving uh, on compressor diving and the hose on compressor broke. broke. And how deep was it? 20 or 30. Oh my, and he died. And he died. That's very sad. 
Although it is an extremely effective method of catching fish, compressor diving is unbelievably dangerous. These guys put their lives on the line every single day to feed their families. Yeah, that's the one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you lose because you, you not use compressor. <laughs> Do a minute. Do a two minutes to get to second maximum. Maximum. <laughs> Hold on a sec. I have to point out how crazy it is that this guy is impressed with my freediving abilities. That's like Usain Bolt being impressed that I went for a jog. With just a little bit of practice, he'd outdive me so easily it would be ridiculous. But unfortunately, he has neither the time nor resources to recreationally freedive. At this point, pretty much the entire island has subscribed to my YouTube channel. Subscribe! Subscribe! <laughs> They're very intrigued at how differently my way of spearfishing is to theirs. I use big fancy guns, big fancy fins, and sometimes catch big fancy fish. Their gear could never hold up against a fish like this, but they don't even want this fish. And if they did, with my gear and just a little bit of training, there is no doubt that each and every one of them would outfish me every day of the week. But they just can't resist the temptation of the compressor. And in their position, I wouldn't either. Basically, I can't, I can barely scuba dive, let alone scuba dive at night with cameras, filming guys compressor diving while spearfishing, adjusting the white balance of a camera and the lights and all these other things. So, our friend Ryan, you can follow him on Instagram, Destination D, is coming along to help film this part. And I hate talking to the camera. Stop. <laughs> You can always retake it if you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not going to. That was painful enough. On the boat ride out to the reef, I discover that not only are these guys expert fishermen, but also fellow content creators. Any for TikTok? Uh, Sierra Lazo. Not TikTok. Uh, Facebook. 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 Oh, okay, okay. Do that TikTok. Do that TikTok. No. <laughs> <laughs> It's immediately apparent just how much more effective nighttime compressor diving is. After just three minutes, he's already caught more fish than he did in three hours of freediving. No wonder he doesn't freedive anymore. The fish are also much easier to catch at night. For instance, after placing a bad shot on this fish, it escapes. But rather than swimming away to safety, it just sort of stays there, floating in the water as if it's asleep. It even allows my other buddy to grab it with his bare hands and kindly give it back to the compressor diver. During a compressor dive, a lot of things can go wrong. The unused slack from his hose is just floating around on the surface, which another boat could easily run over with its propeller. And he usually goes out alone, meaning that there's no one on the surface monitoring the compressor engine, which pumps air down through the hose. But these things are nothing compared to the biggest danger of compressor diving decompression sickness. I'm a pretty novice scuba diver, so I won't pretend to understand the science of decompression sickness, but here's the basic idea. If you do a scuba dive at, say, 75 feet, at the end of your dive, you not only need to ascend back up to the surface very slowly, but at around 15 feet, you also need to stop ascending and just wait there, floating in the middle of the water column for about three minutes. This is called a safety stop. It allows the nitrogen in your blood, which is more concentrated at depth, to be purged from your body before surfacing. If you don't do this, you run the risk of getting decompression sickness, with symptoms such as joint pain, skin itching, rashes, fatigue, dizziness, disorientation, and in severe cases, paralysis and death. It's what happened to that other guy just a few days ago. Um, this like a stroke, yeah? Like a stroke. Then. Yeah, but here in traditional belief, yeah, you know, traditional belief, the devil come to his body. That's what they believe. Ah, for their belief here, the devil sickness like that, we can not go to hospital. It's an incredibly painful way to die. The severity of your decompression sickness depends on the length and depth of your dive. The deeper and longer you dive for, the longer your safety stop needs to be. 
And not only will these guys stay down here literally all night long, but because most of the fish in the shallower depths have already been caught, they're constantly forced to go deeper and deeper in search of more fish. Some of them go as deep as 150 feet for hours at a time. I don't know how to calculate the length of a safety stop for a dive like that, but I'd imagine it's probably like 10 or 20 hours long. If you're a scuba diver who knows how to calculate this, please let us know in the comments. Anyways, with that in mind, listen to what one of the Bajau divers does after spearing an exceptionally large fish during a compressor dive just a few days ago. What do you do? You just have to have a giant fish hanging off your belt for the rest of the day? We take the anchor and put it in the, the boat. So you can have to walk him down, walk him down. Whoa! Not for Baduni. He can up and down, up and down. Oh yeah? Yeah. So you, you shoot the parrot fish at 20 meters. You yeah. go up to the boat, put it on the boat, yeah. and go back down to 20 meters on compressor. Oh! <laughs> Not only did he ascend quickly and not do a safety stop, but according to modern scuba training, you need to wait on the surface for at least an hour before going back down for another dive. To be honest, I'm beginning to wonder if their enlarged spleens give the Bajau people superhuman immunity to decompression sickness as well. Anyways, at the end of our 40 minute dive, it's glaringly obvious why they don't free dive anymore. If this is his catch after less than an hour, imagine how much more he catches over the length of an entire evening. After living in Indonesia for the past three years, I can confidently say that at least some of what goes on in those documentaries is For instance, at the end of that Jago documentary I mentioned earlier, the Bajau diver spears a nice sized midnight snapper and then proceeds to grill it on his little wooden boat all alone in the middle of the ocean. If there weren't cameras around, that would never happen. He'd most likely sell the fish. And if not, he'd at least bring it home to share with his family and cook it properly with rice and their traditional spicy sauce called sambal. But I guess it's more idyllic to just sit on your boat alone, grilling only one fish immediately after catching it. Which is fine if you're telling a fictional story. But in reality, that's a bull made up ending to a story invented to pull at the heartstrings of idealistic Westerners like myself. Don't get me wrong, Jago is one of my favorite movies of all time. I'm just a little skeptical of the last scene. And if they'll take that creative freedom, I can't help but wonder what other creative freedoms they've taken as well. For instance, maybe this guy actually uses a modern scuba mask these days. Which, to be fair, is not nearly as cinematic as those homemade wooden goggles. And maybe his boat is powered by an engine these days. And maybe they truly are amazing divers, but at the same time, maybe they aren't actually better divers than fucking dolphins. Or maybe those documentaries are 100% accurate and modernization is just happening extremely quickly these days. Personally, I think it's a bit of both. This is just one of many Bajau villages scattered throughout all of Southeast Asia. Over the next year, I plan to visit some more remote Bajau villages and see if maybe they are the amazing freedivers I've heard so much about. A few decades ago, the Indonesian government built this road. Literally and metaphorically connecting Bungan Island to the rest of the country. And at the other end of the causeway, on the mainland, is a school. The local kids are all connected to the modern world with smartphones and Although it is a little sad that their freediving heritage is being forgotten, hopefully, over time, better education will lead to better job opportunities. And soon, they won't have to risk their lives compressor diving and the local reefs can be fished a bit less as well. Because, as idyllic as it is to be a hunter-gatherer, it's also pretty ideal to always know where your next meal orange. is coming from. Florida orange. From Florida? Yes. Really? Let's see. Yes, yes, yes. American sea orange. Yes. I don't believe it. Yes. Because as much as I love fishing, I also love being able to buy food when I'm hungry. A few decades from now, when modernization has really sunk in and the locals have enough spare time and money, I wonder if some of the younger members of this Bajau village might sign up for a freediving course. Maybe they'll even head over to Bali for Deep Week, at which point, I like to imagine, they'll outdive all the other students. Because they'll still have those giant spleens. On the way home, I was listening to Joe Rogan's most recent podcast with Jordan Peterson, and what they were talking about was pretty relevant to what I just experienced on Bungan Island. And so I'd like to end this video with an excerpt from their conversation. Thanks for watching. When I, I wandered through the ecological sustainability literature about 10 years ago, and you know, I concluded a couple of things. One was that the best way forward to a sustainable planet 
is to make everyone who's poor rich as fast as you possibly can. And that's not, Lomberg's position. Yeah, not too. to put limits yeah. to growth on, because it right. turns out if you get people above about $5,000 a year in average GDP, they start taking a long-term view of the future. But if you, if you got a bit of wealth, and now you can think over you know, maybe a 20-year period, which is quite the damn luxury, then you actually start being concerned about you know, the quality, the aesthetic quality of the local environment.